Honored to be with you today. Honored that you've chosen to be here today. Know that you've been prayed for. The service has been prayed for. And you're not here by accident. We do believe that God called you to be here today. And so believing, we also believe that God's going to and has perhaps already been speaking to us, which is a wonderful thing. But I love um, reminding myself about God's attributes like we did in that song. It is good for us to remember who God is, to actually meditate on it. You're perfect in all of your ways. There's other things that that song captured along with previous songs this morning. And if you choose to meditate on who God is, It will shape your thinking, it will change your outlook, and it will often redirect your feelings to God. So I want to encourage you to meditate upon who God is, and then from that point, reflect upon what that means to you, right? Perfect in all of your name, all your ways, and I'm your child, that's who I am, right? And what that means. So it's taking what is true about God and applying it to yourself and then reflecting those truths and living out of them. It's a beautiful thing. So please be doing that, okay? So at this time, I'm going to dismiss kids. Kids, glad you're here. Thank you for making people fathers. We appreciate that, kids. Good work. And... (laughs) As you go, um, we're grateful for them. And, of course, we are grateful for fathers. And here comes one right now. We're going to interview Dave Matthew. And his band is going to be up here. It's Dave Matthew. Um, And so he is one of our uh, senior saints. And uh, we're grateful for his testimony. We're going to hear from him. But thank you again, fathers, for sticking with it for continuing to be an example, hopefully, and and granted, we don't always do it perfect. Thank you for saying, you know what? Being in church matters, and it makes a difference, and you are here today. Thank you for praying for your kids. Thank you for loving your children. By the way, thank you for loving the woman who made you a father. Come on now, right? Thank you for loving your spouse. (laughs) That's important and gives security uh, for the children. So do that. Love the Lord. Love your spouse. And look to uh, shape your children oh, nice in, in the, um, <laughs> uh, so that they would become like Christ. Okay, so I'm going to step aside, and uh, we're going to hear from Dave. So thanks, thanks for this. Yes. It's my honor today to spend just a little time talking with Mr. Dave Matthew. And uh, Dave recently had a birthday, if you didn't know, at the end of the month. And he is 90. <laughs> He's been around a little while longer than a lot of us, right? And uh, his wife is Ruby. She's back there. Ruby, would you raise your hand back there? They've been married for, am I, if I'm right in saying this, this is, it's 68 years. I think it's about 68 years. Is that right? 69. We're getting close to the big seven zero number. <laughs> close. So it's so good to have you uh, up here and just to share a little bit about uh, your life and, and who you are, Mr. Dave. Okay, thank you. <laughs> How long have you and Ruby been a part of uh, Crosspoint and going back to Temple before the merger? It was Temple Baptist. How long have you been a part of the church? Well, in uh, 1964, uh, we moved back from California and we came to visit the church here. We wanted to visit a few churches before we went back to our home church. And uh, so we visited, and we never left. So we've been here <laughs> 60 years. <laughs> 60 years. Woohoo! Yeah. Wow. I wasn't here yet. No. Okay. I mean, on the world, in the world. <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> can, you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how and when you came to know Jesus, when you started to follow Jesus? Well, I was a, a farm kid that was uh, raised in a Christian home. And um, 
I, we really never got off the farm other than school and uh, and church, and so I I wasn't exposed to the uh, I guess the worldly ways, <laughs> and I never really gave much thought to uh, my need to uh, be born again. Uh, but that changed when I was 11, and um, I, uh, I, we had an evangelist that came to our church, First Baptist Church here in Rockford, and uh, he, he convinced me that, that we're all sinners. And uh, so, and he was kind of a, he was a fire and brimstone preacher. And uh, so you might say I was scared to the cross. <laughs> and, I, and I really, uh, I'm eternally thankful for that. Um, so over the years here at, at Temple and then at Crosspoint, but how, in what ways have you uh, served here in the church? You and Ruby were a part of, of various ministries, I believe, along the way. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I, I've always uh, tried to be involved <clears throat> in the church and wherever I could. And so I, <clears throat> I was uh, a deacon several times, and uh, I worked on the Christian Education Board and the trustees. And... Um, and I was also, uh, I also worked on the tutoring program when they had it here. And um, for, for many years, uh, Ruby and I uh, headed up the visitation teams for uh, visiting shut-ins. And we, we had, I think, uh, about 15 shut-ins that we made it visits on every month and uh, that was a that was a very meaningful ministry yeah. because many of these people that we visited that uh, we were the only ones they ever had visit them oh. and uh, so they were very appreciative of that <clears throat> and uh, I believe, well, Ken and Tura Soderstrom and uh, Larry and Jackie Smith were part of that group, part, helped us with that. And <clears throat> I don't know. If you guys are all still making it here every week. No <laughs> one has to visit you. You're here. In fact, when I called him, we were talking the other day on the phone. We had a little delay in, in uh, connecting because he was mowing his lawn. So I want you to know that. At 90, he mows his own grass. Yeah. And lastly, I think I were, we, uh, Bob Carlson asked uh, Ruby and me if we would uh, represent the seniors on the merger uh, team that we had when we were considering the merger with uh, Mosaic. And uh, that was a, that was a once in a lifetime experience. That's right. <laughs> it was like uh, riding a bumper car. And uh, <laughs> every time we think we had it all settled, they Whew. get bumped and <laughs> throw us off the course. And, yeah, but uh, God intervened and God made it happen. So I'm pleased for that. Awesome. I just going to tell just the quickest little story. When we had the very first merger meetings, and I remember uh, we we the very first one of people from Mosaic and Temple about becoming Crosspoint eventually, and we prayed together afterwards. We went into the prayer room. And we had small groups. And I was in the group with you and Ruby. And one other person, I can't remember who that was, but I was nervous because I thought, this guy's never going to like what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I don't know if he's going to, 
is, is this going to work? And we had the sweetest time of praying together, and I just saw your heart. It was amazing. So that, that affected me. So just want you to know that. I think you already know that, but I had a great time together. What are some of the things you like about Crosspoint today? Well, the first thing is that I really appreciate that Pastor Days preaches the yes. gospel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, I like the way you uh, use, there's so much talent in this church, and I, I really appreciate the way you use them in the worship service. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I got my list is really long here. That's, that's great, though. Yeah. I'm so glad you guys are still involved. You yeah. love it. You've seen the changes in these last few years that have, that have happened, and you guys still back us and support us, and you're with us all the way. We love that. Thank you for that. Yeah. And then it's really refreshing to see the, so many uh, races and uh, ages and, yes. and uh, the, just a mixture of people that is so refreshing to see in our services. And yeah. um, uh, and the the love and and the fellowship among our our congregation is just amazing and uh, and of course if it wasn't for Crosspoint I wouldn't have had so many late in life friends. So. Beautiful, that's awesome. Well, I'm glad I've gotten to know you guys a little bit. I'm I'm grateful for that. So thinking about back on your life, 90 years, what would be some advice or some thoughts you would give to younger Christians like a lot of us in here who are on our walk with Jesus? Is there anything you can share with us that would be helpful? I'm sure there is. Well, I, I'm speaking from man's perspective here, but uh, I think it's important for men to have a a male friend uh, that they can be accountable to. And well, that's so great. That's uh, for me. Thank you so much for sharing today. He did not want to do this. I made him do it. Love you, Mr. Dave. Man, thank you, Dave, for sharing. Wait, number number seven just got answered. Ring. Number 16 was the answer. And over time, look back. And this is super practical and super helpful. I started to see these requests. And often we pray things, and they're not necessarily paying attention to how those things turn out. Pay attention not just to what your requests are, but pay attention to what happens because you're praying. And when you look back at this list and you'll see God work, you'll be encouraged. Now, everything that I have prayed has not happened the way that I want it, nor when I want it. That's okay. You know why? Number one, I know that God hears me. Why? Because it gives an invitation. Not just to me. Oh, you're a pastor. <laughs> Stop. I'm a person. You're a person. Again, I don't have more special access than you do, right? I don't have a backstage pass. <laughs> we have an invitation. He delights to listen to his children. If you are a good father, you make time for your children, right? I do. I'm a busy dude. If my girls call, I say, excuse me, I need to take this, right? We have access, so I know that, and so I know that God hears me, and I trust him, right? Now, when my girls were young, they asked me all types of things. For instance, can I eat cotton candy every meal all the time, right? In their mind, of course they'll say yes. What is better than cotton candy, right? <laughs> Me knowing just a little bit more than them, okay. <laughs> Vetoed that. Dad, you're horrible. How can you do that? 
I love you, Anna and Deborah. If you ate cotton candy all the time, <laughs> you would be super sick. You wouldn't grow the way you would, right? And it'll be a real problem. Will you trust that I have your best will in mind? Okay. Here's the deal when I pray and when you pray. God does not answer the way that you have requested. Do you trust him? God, I trust you to this. I believe in you because you are perfect in all of your ways. We just sang that. And so God, help me to understand. Help me to know. Help me to understand what your will is so that I can grow to be like you in my thinking so that I can mature. God, help me in this. A good father helps his children to mature. God does the same thing to us. That is why that is one of the names he calls himself. Father, along with other things. The most important meeting that you have every day is not with your boss. The most important meeting that you have every day is not with your spouse. The most important meeting that we have every day is with our Father. And the most important meetings that we have here as a church is not Sunday morning. This is important. You know what's more important? Our prayer meetings. Because out of that connection with God, everything else flows that is of eternal worth or of, of any significance. Because I know without God's Spirit helping, directing, changing, convicting, healing, opening, all of these type of things, Everything else is fruitless, less fruit. As you go into your day, and I don't know what this day has, I don't know what tomorrow has really for any of us per se, we might have our plans, remember that your most important meeting of the day is with your Father. I pray this morning that this would be true of our congregation because often we get sidetracked by all of the other things that are urgent, but not important. Are you hearing me? Right? I got to get the kids dressed. I got to get to school. I got to get to work. I have to get the lawn mowed or whatever it is. Are those things important to some degree? Yeah. Right? But less important about your meeting with your father. And I say particular meeting because I like making my meetings. I live by my task list, my to-do list, and my calendar, right? And so I look at my calendar all the time because people are important to me. If I set a meeting with you, I want to be there. I want to be ready. I want to be on time. Why? Because you're important to me. And this is a way that I can reflect your importance of remembering. And I forget a lot of stuff, so I have to write it down. Right? If meetings with people are important, I use the word meeting. What about a meeting with God? God! Who's alive and active, who speaks through his word by his spirit, who communicates to us, who can change things. Starting with us. What a privilege we have to pray. Did you hear my word privilege? Not a burden, not an obligation. Would you like it if your kids say happy fathers today because they're obligated to say it to you? How does that feel? Not so good. Or they have to spend time with you because they should. God, help us to see connecting with God not a drudgery but a delight. Okay. Spend time in His Word. Meditate on His attributes. Read things are there. Ask God to make your soul happy in Him. 
and then engage the day. Bring about your burdens, and you have burdens. There are things that you are carrying. How do I know that? Because I'm a human too. People that you're concerned about, situations you don't feel prepared for. Hurts or hang-ups or things of this nature that are there. Talk to your father about it. And understand that that meeting, if you're going to miss a meeting, don't miss that meeting. Right? Oh, you know, I'll talk to him later. I, I do that sometimes, right? I'm not coming up here, hey, right? I've had to make it a discipline. First thing I do in the morning. I don't need to meet with you today. Why? <laughs> I'm a fallen person. I need to connect with God first. I have to do it to get through my day. You need to as well. So I, I don't know <laughs> what I can do to, to emphasize this. Right? I, I want you to think about that. Right? It's a privilege, right? If you had a meeting with the President of the United States, regardless if you voted for him or not, if you had that meeting, you would make sure that you be there, right? Ready. God is much greater than any president or any celebrity or any person, right? My prayer is that we would delight to be with God. My prayer is that our prayer meetings will be so chuck full of people we'd have to meet in here, right? Because prayer matters. For I know that through your prayers, God's provision of His Spirit, that there will be deliverance. I'm encouraging you, understand your prayers are powerful. It changes you. It changes things. It's the most important thing we can do because that is where the power is. And by the way, if the enemy is going to keep you away from anything, he'll keep you away from prayer. Even more than church. <laughs> he'll keep you away from the Word. Let's get him distracted, right? Get his mind thinking about other stuff. Hey, look at that Facebook post. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> 20 minutes later, where did 20 minutes go? I might. <laughs> you know how this works, right? I know how it works. Press in. Keep notes. Take a passage like the psalm that was read today. Just pray that. I don't know what to pray. Then pray that. I pray scripture all the time. It helps me. Pray these things. Look around. Okay. First thing, understand your prayers are powerful. Do it. The prayer of a righteous person, which God has made us righteous, is powerful and effective. Second thing from this passage. Encourage us all. The Word of God encourages us to aim to honor Christ in all things. So Paul continues to explain to his brothers and sisters in the faith, hey, I know I'm going to be delivered because you're praying. God's Spirit helps me. And let me also encourage you this way. He says, I eagerly expect, this is verse 20 of Philippians 1, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Whew. Got goosebumps just thinking about it. So Paul was saying, thank you so much. Thank you for praying for me. And he says, now, I expect that I won't be ashamed. I will live in a manner worthy of the gospel. I expect that will be the case, and I hope that will be the case. 
which tells me that Paul knew that he had his own flesh, right? Our own flesh is our own sinful nature, doesn't want to obey God. The part of us that God makes us new, right, that we can walk in accordance to the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, wants to please God and does please God, but we still have this internal fight, right? Part of us want to do that, and part of us, hmm, rather not, right? And so Paul said, hey, listen, I expect to honor Christ. I hope that I will honor Christ and I not be ashamed, right? And then I'll have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. And this is my goal, that Christ will be exalted. So this is the Apostle Paul that was asking for this, right? God, help me not to be ashamed because people knew that I'm a Christian. And I hope that people know that you're a Christian. Sometime my behavior doesn't line up to my belief. I'm glad someone said right. <laughs> right. That's probably true for you. I don't like it when that happens, Right? And I, the Lord has called me out on several occasions. One of them is this. I have Verizon for my phone, right? Sometimes my phone has a mind of its own. So I have to go in to talk to the young people who know things, right? I go to Verizon this one time, right? There's a lot of people in Verizon store. And I got stuff to do, right? One of my personal issues is impatience. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Right? I just, blah, let's go, right? I, I, pray for your pastor. I need some help. <laughs> pray for my wife. She's like, no, pray for me. <laughs> touche, touche. I totally deserve that. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm there at Verizon. Okay, there's lots of people there. My phone isn't working. The longer it takes, the more irritable I become. What is wrong with these people? Get out the way. So I finally get with a lady, and the lady's like, and then it's like, oh, we got to get in the phone, and like, uh, okay, okay, okay. And then I like, don't remember my password, of course, or whatever this stuff is. She goes in, and so there's a security question there, right? <laughs> um, what? And I was like, crabby. Right? <laughs> and then the security question was, what's your favorite book? My answer was the Bible. And when I said that, it's like the rooster crowed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right, Peter? The Bible. I was living at that time in a way that wasn't worthy of the gospel, you understand this? The Lord called me out, right? pastor. Right. <laughs> and so Paul is saying, hey, I hope and I expect that I'll live this way, but man, I need some courage, I need some help to speak in, to step up, right? If we want to live as citizens of heaven, right, we need that as well. If you're a Christian, man, you do. The Holy Spirit, you want to serve God. I know that about you. But man, we still have to deal with our sinful nature, right? Paul agonized about that. He's like, I can't wait till I get to heaven where it's going to be done, right? And so he says, hey, I hope and I expect this way because my aim is to exalt Christ while I'm in the body in life, that's my aim, or even in my death. I like that. How I die. What I am like then. And then he says this phrase, right? For to me, to live is Christ. That's why I live. And to die. 
mind-blowing, right? Paul knew that when he died, he wasn't going to lose all the stuff, right? Often people think as they're getting closer to, to death, they're going to lose the connection with their family, or they're going to lose their wealth, they're going to lose their freedom, or they're going to lose their ability to do stuff. The opposite is true because of what Christ says, that, hey, if you die, you're going to be with me, Scripture talks about reward that is there. Scripture talks about that Christ is there. When we die, we're not moving away from our treasure. We're moving towards it. Right? We're not losing our relationships. We're gaining it. We're not losing our life. We're going to get it. Real life. Right? I want you to die with a big smile on your face. Seriously. I get to be with Christ. Spirit is here, and I've lived for him. I lived in him. He has been my focus. He's been my life, and now it's just gain. Right? Paul said, for me to, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let that be your motto, right? If you're into tattoos, that would be a great one. I don't have any, but I would consider that, right? To live is Christ and to die is gain, right? That kind of covers it, right? What I do, I live in him and for him and with him and about him, and when I die, it's gain. So either way, I win, right? Regardless, right? What are you living for? Is it... To live is football, grandkids, money. What gets you most excited about? Barbecue, right? I don't know. My hope is that you are so captured by the beauty of Christ, you want nothing else but him, and everything will pale in comparison to him. You'd be captured by him. Though we spent so much time in the book of John, behold the Christ, right? If he captures you, you can't wait to see him face to face. If you're in love with him and he's captured your heart, you can't help but share about him. You can't help but desire to please him. To live is Christ, to die is gain. This last week I was um, preparing for this message. I read a commentary by a pastor named Kent Hughes, who was a pastor for a long time in Wheaton, just down the road from us. And he tells a story about um, a surgeon in his congregation a beloved surgeon, a beloved elder. His name is uh, Andrew Cho was his name. And Andrew was getting up in uh, years per se, beloved friend, and he needed to go into the hospital to get a uh, stint cleaned out in his heart. And so they put him under the anesthetic, they wheeled him into the operating room, and they started the surgery prematurely to the family, the surgeon came out and says, I can't keep going. There's too much bleeding. Call your family. And so at the, he was at uh, Northwestern Hospital. The family rushed in. The kids rushed in. And they were just crying and weeping because of this eminent homegoing of their father. And Andrew was there, and um, he came to out of the anesthetic, and he recognized that his family were there, and they were just weeping. And he himself was in some intense pain. He couldn't even talk at that point, and so he motioned to them, motioned to them, and they finally understood that he wanted 
something to write with. And they gave him a pen, they gave him a piece of paper, and at this point he couldn't even write in a straight line. So he started to write very slowly and deliberately. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. And then he wrote very slowly, says it took him about a minute, hallelujah. And then he was able to speak, and he says, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. It's a powerful Our living, let it be. Christ, may he capture you. It's my prayer for you as a pastor here, as your pastor. May you be captured by Christ. And may, in so doing, you choose to live for him. And you understand, not just in your living, it's Christ, but in your dying, it's gain. This is what Paul understood. This is what Paul was declaring. He says, hey, I'm, I'm convinced that I'm going to be delivered. But guess what? If I die, it's Cain. Right? And he goes on in this passage, right? And he was struggling as he was writing to know what the Lord had for him, right? And he was able to discern the mind of the Lord to perceive what was going to happen next. Because of a few things, right? And this is the next point, our next point in this passage. Discern the mind of the Lord. Okay. I want you to think about this. Discern the mind of the Lord. God, what are you saying? And what does this mean? Right? Verse 22, Philippians. Now, this inner struggle is going on, and Paul says, okay, well, if I'm going... If I am to go on living in the body, oh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I don't know. He says, I'm torn between the two. Now, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So Paul was torn. He says, man, you know, this prison, you know, it's not the funnest place to be, right? The room service is terrible, right? The bed is the floor. The view, horrible. Zero stars, right? Out of five. He says, hey, to be with Christ, far better. <laughs> Even if everything was perfect for you, <laughs> to be with Christ is far better. That's, by the way, good news. Right? When you die, it's not over, it's just beginning. <laughs> know that. He says, oh, that's what I know. He says, but it's going to be Better if I live, it means I, I get to do more fruitful labor, and it's more urgent than I'm around that I remain in the body, right? So how do you discern the mind of the Lord? So he's contemplating things. So my, my first response to this is no one understands Scripture. Well, why do you say that, Dave? Well, because Paul understood that it was better to be with Christ. When he dies, it's game. He knew that from Scripture. He knew that. So he knew Scripture. He's like, okay, here's my option. That is better for me to die, so I desire that, because he knew that from Scripture. But he also knew that God has a desire for people to grow in his faith. He also knew that he was gifted and called to do this. And so there was a great desire, but there was an urgent need. And Paul said, well, in understanding what I know about you, and understanding about what I know about God's heart, and understanding that these people have been praying for me, 
that I'm torn, right? And I, I want to understand and discern, right? And now, second, so I want you to know and understand Scripture, what is true about God, what is true about His goodness, what is true about His mind. You learn it from that. Second, use some sound reasoning in your circumstance. So we puts this out, lays this out here, says, well, it's far more necessary for you that I remain in the body, and he continues in verse 25. Now he says, I'm convinced of this, convinced of this. He goes, I know I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. I really like that, by the way, progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, my deliverance, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound. That there was this great answer of prayer because I was set free. So Paul understood what was going to happen in the future based upon, number one, what he knew about God. Number two, what he knew about his circumstances. People were praying. People had needs, knowing that God wanted him to grow. He says, well, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be delivered because you have been praying. God's going to answer that prayer so that you will rejoice in God and that your faith would grow and, oh, I love this, the joy in the faith will grow, right? And so therefore, I know what's going to happen, right? Do you sometimes not understand what God's will for your future is? The answer to that is yes. I don't always know, right? And sometimes at big crossroads, I have to really think and pray, right? And you start not by your own desire. Your desire is important. You start by God's desire, God, what is best in this circumstance? What is going to be most honoring of you? God, what is your plan here? And then you assess that and you assess who you are and you assess what the need is. Granted, at some point you will go home to be with the Lord, but until then, you got stuff to do, right? And so, God, where can your heart, my design, and the greatest need come together so that you'll be most glorified. That's where God is sending you. Well, I don't like Rockford. Well, God does. <laughs> well, I don't like this church. Well, God does. Most of the time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he does. But if your aim is to live for Christ, you say, ah, I know why I'm here. <laughs> Hear me now. Hear me. It matters. It matters. And if you say, you know what? I am not living for earthly reward. All of this stuff you are leaving behind. There are no trailer hitches on hearses. You're going to leave it here. So you might as well send it on ahead. Hey, to die is gain, y'all. I love this. It helps us. So know that your prayers are powerful. I'm coming in for a landing, inviting Rick up here. He's going to lead us in communion. Know that your prayers are powerful, okay? And I don't know what you need to take home today. Take something home. Make your prayer meeting the most important. That's his will, right?